really have understood from the title of the remark and get to my speech. I will mainly deal with the responsibility of the editor and uh, sum up my point from the beginning. I would say that the fictionalization of nonfiction shows how essential an editor is. First of all, I consider the phenomenon as a good thing because what enriches nonfiction is the use of fiction reading techniques. It makes the reading more enjoyable. I'm comfortable with the idea of letting the imagination of the writer's wanderings. What the, what the job of the nonfiction editor is, is to bring, back them, to bring them back to reality when it's time to release their work. First, we have to let them wander in, and then we have to bring them back to reality. Search books, uh, nonfiction books, narrative nonfiction books can exist only because there is a serious and professional editor behind every piece. There is no such thing as an objective reality as far as I'm concerned, either of fiction or of nonfiction. We can do both. Um, they can set apart, uh, the writers can set apart their subjectivity. Maybe to that extent we can consider that a non-fiction piece written with fiction writing techniques is more honest because it says from the beginning that it's not a neutral account of the so-called reality. And the use of fiction writing techniques can bring life to fact, which is the point we realize, I think, when we read books. My point as a translator of both narrative and journalistic nonfiction is that narrative nonfiction gives you more freedom. I would define translation as a kind of constrained freedom. You're free to use the words you want, but you can't make them mean anything else that what the writer intended. To that extent, narrative nonfiction gives a translator more liberty because the reality uh, a non-fiction, a narrative non-fiction piece is describing is stage reality. It's staged in the writer's mind, so up to you as a translator to stage this reality in your own mind. And that's where my freedom, that's where the translator freedom, I think, excels. I remember, for instance, the difficulty I had when I translated The Boys in the Boat, which is an, uh, the story of the US rowing crew uh, who won the gold medal in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And at the very beginning of the book, the, the author, Daniel James Brown, describes the shadows of the crew in Seattle. And he adds that the damage boats were repaired in a workshop located in a loft. And I, I was very puzzled by that word loft because I didn't know what the writer intended to describe with it. So I wrote to him an email asking, what do you mean by loft? And then he, he replied by sending a very unhelpful photography taken <laughs> from the interior. So I said, thank you, but it's not enough to, to help me. And so I needed to be, since I needed to be able to describe the room with my own words, I had no choice but to go to Seattle to visit the shadows to see by myself what that loft was. I did it. I went to Seattle not only to visit the shadows, of course, but I took advantage of my trip to see the places where the action of the book took place. And I consider this trip helped me a lot to reconstruct the reality in my own French world instead of technically translating the reality written in English. At the end, for, it appeared that the loft was more of an attic mezzanine annex thing. <laughs> and of course, we don't have any French word to describe this. It was my liberty to describe it with my own words provided I could describe the reality I saw. On the contrary, when I translated Bob Woodward's Obama's Walls, uh, which is an investigative book about the way Barack Obama dealt with the war in Iraq at the beginning of his presidency, I didn't need to go to the White House to check the color of the oval of his carpet. <laughs> and so I would have liked to do it. <laughs> Maybe one day for another book. And I didn't, know, I didn't need it because this reality was obvious to everybody, given the number of descriptions we read in books, in articles, we even can see the carpet on TV, uh, on TV reports. So it was an objective reality, and I hadn't the choice of the, of the world to describe it because everybody could check. The difficulty lies in knowing what comes from reality and what has been imagined by the white <coughs> Trying to establish it is the most fascinating part of the translator because you have to dig into the documents used by the writer to stage the reality, which is, which I think this 
using of document and we're doing in, in a way the work of the writer is the most fascinating part of the translating experience. To my mind, the main benefit of using fiction writing techniques in non-fiction is to reach a wider audience than with traditionally or academic, if you prefer, uh, written non-fiction. Furthermore, it's a big help to popularize the last discoveries in the field of history of science. One of the greatest risks is that the author replaces facts as the basis of the book. In fiction, we read a novel written by, uh, by an author we liked, whereas in non-fiction, we read a book dealing with the subject we are interested in. So I'm very concerned by the fact that mixing, mixing fiction and non-fiction can sometimes harm people. We should never forget that behind the facts, behind the story, there are some real people in non-fiction who can be offended by the way their reality or the way uh, they live their reality is staged. And here I'm thinking of a French book released years ago, which was written by Bernard-Henri Lévy, uh, and who was entitled Who Killed Daniel Thur. It was an, uh, a report about that uh, US journalist abducted and at the end killed by Taliban. And in a, according to me, very shocking chapter, Bernard Levy described what happened, what was in the mind of Daniel Pearl at the time he was executed. And I remember having read some article about the wife of the reporter reaction being also very shocked, being first very shocked, because nobody knows what happened and it's part of his intimacy. And you know, just reading it, I feel ill at ease and then I had the same reaction that uh, his widow, saying that it shouldn't be in a book, whatever. Furthermore, the editor needs to protect the reader from the writer from press attacks on reader complaints or legal proceedings, and for that, uh, the editor should know where is the border in a given world between facts and fiction. In other words, he shouldn't, the publisher shouldn't let the writers do all what they want to for their own sake. Well, it's well done. I don't consider the mixing of fiction and non-fiction as tricky. It all depends on the subject of the book. The main criteria, and maybe the only one, should be the level of transparency about the mixing. It should be clearly stated in somewhere in, the, in a book, maybe in a foreword or on the back of a text, anyway, in, in time, in, anyway, somewhere very uh, obvious that the book is either fiction or non-fiction, and in the last case, in the case of non-fiction, whether it has been written by a fiction writing technique. That's why the novel, uh, it's a novel, it's a non-fiction piece written like a novel for me is very good because it says everything in a very simple way. Once the rule is set, I think everything is possible. But there is a risk. It's when an editor is elastic with his, uh, with, um, so classi with um, classification of fiction and non-fiction. The author can be a can't, because there can be some confusion, and the responsibility of the editor, according to me, is to be constant and aware of what she or he is doing. The editor is also accountable to the authors he works with. Some of them may be seduced by fictionalized non-fiction, but they see search books on the bestseller list. But when one succeeds, as we all know, 10 or 20 fail. The reason is it's far more difficult to write a non-fiction book with the tools of fiction than to make a traditional non-fiction piece. And to my mind, there is far more constraints in the field of narrative and non-fiction than in the field of academic fiction. You should be accurate and imaginative, excuse me, accurate and imaginative, deal with facts and the structure of the books, know where you want to go without having the freedom to choose your, your world. We must warn the authors as publisher, we must warn them uh, when they want to write narrative non-fiction to see how difficult the task is. If needed, our reunion today shows how heavy the burden is and I hope we will make it lighter by sharing the burden. Thank you.